Okay, so I'll start. Hello, everyone. Um, um, my name is Antonio Manesco. I'm a doctorate candidate uh, at the University of Sao Paulo. And I'm um, here today to, to talk about uh, this work that I've done in collaboration with Jose Lado from Nauta University, which is about correlations, uh, correlation induced uh, value topology in buckles within uh, superlattices. So the systems uh, we'll be looking at uh, are sketched here, which uh, I'll give a bit more details on how to do that uh, in an experiment. But uh, the main idea is that we have these uh, super lattices of graphene, where in-plane strain uh, leads to this buckling transition. And we have these uh, oscillatory profile topography profile, uh, which leads to uh, effective pseudo-magnetic field, and so we'll see a bit of uh, what are the electronic consequences of having this uh, modulated strain. Uh, this work is on archive, you can find the reference right here. And if you are also uh, interested in taking a look at our code and maybe switching a bit, uh, playing uh, with yourself with our uh, results, uh, you can check our uh, Zenodo repository. Um, so, before I, I actually go to the theory part, let me um, explain you a bit about the experimental motivation for this work. So, this is a work uh, done by the group of Evandre, uh, the, the, where they, they did those buckled graphene super lattices. So, uh, the main idea here is uh, that uh, uh, well, I don't know exactly how they do that in an experiment, but they create those two uh, uh, those two sort of waves in graphene, not exactly a wave because it doesn't propagate, but these bumps in graphene. And it turns out that uh, to uh, for this structure to relax, it actually uh, leads to a, a lot of uh, uh, strain uh, uh, in plane strain. So, so we can imagine that this bump is trying to, to go down, and that will add a lot of strain in the in the flat regions of the system. Um, so here's a, a microscopy of this system. So those reach one and reach two here are, are those two bumps that you see in, in this illustration. And then because of this in plane strain, what happens is that uh, we have actually a buckling transition. So you can imagine that if you take a look at my camera now, uh, the idea is quite simple. So it's pretty much like these, you, you add a lot of in-plane strain and, and, and the system buckles as, uh, as this strain is applied to, to these flat regions. And because we have like, uh, because there are like two of those reads here, they, they, uh, they add like a lot of uh, in-plane strain in this region in between. And it turns out that there is a buckling transition, but this buckling transition is not a simple bump, but actually a, a, a periodic pattern that appears in the system. Uh, so here's a bit hard to see, but if we zoom in them further, you can see that there, uh, the topography is actually, uh, looks quite, a, a, looks like a, a triangular uh, super lattice. Uh, and if you look the height of it, it's about two angstrom. So that it's a, a very smooth uh, uh, modulation of the height of the system, but uh, that's due to a, a really strong strain. So even though this modulation is quite small, you, you also have a lot of in-plane strain in the system that leads to, to, to several consequences, which I'll highlight uh, now. So, I don't know if you are all familiar with straining graphene, but if you're not, uh, I'll give a brief introduction here. Uh, so if we think about a tight binding model for graphene, uh, we, we have basically a, a, each atom is connected to three uh, nearest neighbors. And because of crystal symmetry, those uh, the hopping energies uh, for an electron to hop uh, for any of those three neighbors should be the same. So. Uh, in fact, in this Hamiltonian, could actually factor out the, this hopping. But as we introduce a string, and uh, even uh, if we introduce a, a non uniform string, uh, then these hoppings are, are uh, not equal anymore and they are actually space dependent. So uh, if 
if we take this Hamiltonian now and go to a low energy theory, uh, we we modify the the, the graphene Hamiltonian. So uh, this first term here, uh, proportional to momentum, is uh, the the massless direct Hamiltonian for graphene, which is well known. But uh, as we introduce string, uh, there is this extra term here. It's a gauge field, and uh, it's pretty much like a, a, a magnetic field, but uh, the, the, the difference that there is this tau dependence and tau here is the valley index. So for uh, each valley, the, the sign of this uh, gauge field changes. So which makes things uh, valley dependent and you, you already might think that this is a, a, a route to get valley dependent phenomenon. Uh, this gauge field, of course, is dependent on these hot things uh, here. So there's a nice relation you can find. So uh, you could map the type body model to this casino model, or vice versa, by, by using those relations. Um, right. So, but but this is not exactly a, a magnetic field. Uh, in this uh, in this work, we focused on uh, so. Uh, if you if you think uh, we have a two-dimensional material with a gauge field, so we would expect some Landau quantization. Um, but but this field is not exactly a, a, a magnetic field, so let me highlight uh, the difference here. We're focusing only at the lowest Landau level of the system, and if it's an, uh, a magnet a magnetic field that is generating this uh, gauge field here. The lowest lambda level has this nice property where uh, if you look at the wave functions in one of the graphene sublattices, it has a well defined valley polarization, and at the other sublattices, it has the opposite uh, valley isospin. So we could, we could call these some sort of uh, sublattice valley locking. But uh, when this gauge field is actually uh, due to strain, this uh, Valley dependence uh, actually plays an important role on the, on the lowest lambda level. So, so the, the eigenstates are, are now uh, live in a single sublattice. So we have this sublattice polarization, even though they can uh, have both uh, valley isospin. And this was also observed in, in the experiment. So here I'm showing you again the topography of the system now, uh, a 3D map of the topography. And we can uh, check like three different regions, I, I, I guess, which are uh, quite different in their electronic properties. So we can take a look at this, uh, those crests here, uh, where uh, you should expect the strain to be maximum. Um, uh, if you if you do uh, scanning to lens spectroscopy at this region, you see that there are those peaks here, which are uh, Basically, the Landau quantization uh, because of these uh, pseudo magnetic field. And by, by the separation between those peaks, you can actually infer how large is this uh, pseudo magnetic field. And this is about 100 Tesla, it's a huge field. Uh, we can also go to other regions of the system. So, for example, the, the, the regions where the, the topography free, uh, the, the height. Uh, reach the lowest value, and then we, we have the opposite curvature, which also uh, has a finite uh, pseudo magnetic field. You, you can see here uh, in this blue plot. Uh, it's not that clear here uh, where the, the Landau peaks. You can probably see some small bumps, but uh, uh, you can actually uh, you need to actually take the derivative to to find them properly. Um, and if you look at the intermediate region, there are some regions which are basically flat, and, and, and then you see uh, basically no magnetic field at all. We can also see the, the sublattice polarization. So uh, if we take a look at this uh, red region, which corresponds to, to the maximum height, you see a clear uh, triangular lattice here, which means that you have this uh, sublattice polarization. And if you go to the, the regions with the opposite curvature, you see the other sublattice populated them in intermediate regions, you see both sublattice. So yeah, the, the, those signals are pretty much a pseudomagnetic field, it agrees with theory, so we're good. Um, 
we can uh, model this magnetic field then uh, to have this functional form, uh, which pretty much resembles the, the tri triangular lattice structure that uh, we see in the topography profile. And uh, well, actually what you are seeing here is the, is the valley very curvature, the local value of, of valley very curvature. And you see that this is changing the sign dep depending on, on the regions, which uh, signals that you, you have anomalous velocity for, uh, for uh, with different signs for different valley. And that uh, leads to like valley currents. So we are already in a way to, to actually try to find valley dependent phenomena here. So let's take a look now at the energy spectrum for, for the system. So uh, here in the left, I show you the, the term structure for the theme. You see the two derived cones. Note that the, the, the energy scale here is much smaller than the, the bandwidth. So you, you see pretty much just the, the derived cone. Um, I'm plotting these uh, in, in the, the mini brillion zone. So let me um, emphasize that here. Um, we have like uh, now this super lattice and, and then we have a new Brillouin zone. We're plotting this uh, tiny Brillouin zone. Um, but still you see that uh, those uh, uh, lowercase kappa and kappa prime points now have uh, still have the, the direct cones. And as we introduce strain, uh, of course, the, this modulation uh, mixes those, those bands, the, the, there are gap openings, and, and now we get this uh, pseudo Landau quantization. So uh, what you're looking here, in, uh, this region in gray here, shows the, the lowest pseudo Landau level. Uh, it has uh, some finite dispersion, of course, because we have a, a periodic potential. Um, uh, you see that we still have uh, the rack cones uh, here and here. Um, uh, so we will be focusing on these uh, this very energy window here. And now that, uh, notice uh, again that the, the bandwidth of the system is much smaller than the Hoffman. So we use that as an argument to actually uh, study correlations uh, reason. Um, there is one more thing that we can notice, that it, which is that with this pseudomagnetic field, we actually uh, if we look at the local lens of states of the system, uh, it's no longer a triangular lattice as the, the, the pseudomagnetic field would suggest, but it's actually a, a honeycomb super lattice. So the electronic structure has several properties of the honeycomb super lattice. And then uh, we start to think how to properly model these uh, honeycomb super lattice with a minimal model. So just to reproduce those bands in that gray area that I showed you. Uh, so we took some assumptions and, and uh, which is based by time reversal symmetry, uh, since we, we have no magnetic field or magnetism right now. Um, we also uh, assume valley conservation, which seems reasonable if you look at this electronic structure of showing valley number, and we see that uh, those bands are valley polarizer. Um, and we also uh, assume trifold rotations. So uh, by by uh, with these symmetry constraints, we can actually find a uh, Hamiltonian, which we uh, map uh, directly to the k mu Hamiltonian. So let me try to to explain in a bit uh, that because it, it's not uh, it's a bit tricky. So uh, when we are looking to this mini Brillouin zone. Uh, we we now have, have these mini valley numbers, which are uh, pretty much the, 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 the some expectation value related with electrons uh, in these uh, lowercase kappa uh, points. So we we'll call those mini valleys. But we also have something uh, from from the original valley uh, physics of graphene which now will be, uh, when we go to a low energy theory, we, we pretty much have this as, a, as a, an isospin. So uh, we'll treat the, the original valleys as, as, as this uh, isospin, and, and, and we have also those mini valleys. And this gain uh, Hamiltonian is actually doing uh, 
something uh, slightly different to, to, to the original NML model. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that in, uh, this term here, which is uh, in the KML uh, model, a uh, uh, spin arc coupling term, it will now be some sort of, uh, well, it will depend on the values. So instead of having SZ for, for, for spins, we'll have tau Z for values. Um, then the rest is pretty much the same. Uh, it's just about the physical meaning, but we can still map directly one model into the other. Uh, there is also um, a nice way that uh, having this Hamiltonian, you can uh, also try to imagine how to reproduce the, the, the band structure for the, the lowest lambda level. Um, so here I, I show you uh, those dashed lines actually show the direct cones for graphene. If we have, uh, we, if we set this uh, sublatticing balance to be zero, and if we also set this lambda to be zero, uh, and as we turn on this sublattice imbalance M, we actually have a, a finite gap. Uh, we could also set M to zero and, and lambda to, to, to a finite value, and then we would have a, a, a finite uh, gap uh, with different signs depending on, on the valley as a spin. So, uh, we saw that the electronic structure actually have Dirac cones, but those Dirac cones have uh, different value polarization. So sorry for that, but let me come back here. So this Dirac cone has a negative value number and this one has positive value number. So uh, to, to actually have this situation, we need to set uh, those two maps to have the same value. So capital M and, and uh, lowercase m to have the same value. Uh, and when we do that, we have pretty much the same dispersion as the low energy, uh, as the lowest Landau level. So um, note here that uh, we are right at the boundary of the topological phase transition. If uh, this mass is slightly smaller than, than capital M, uh, then we have a topological phase. And if it's greater than M, we have a uh, trivial insulator. So uh, we would have topological phase transitions if we can change this ratio to be smaller uh, than zero. Uh, well, uh, yeah, the change uh, needs to be smaller than zero, not the ratio. And there is a nice way uh, we can think of doing that. It's not the, the, the one I'll be focusing on, but let me just stress out this, uh, this, uh, this path to, to to have a topological phase transition, which is pretty much uh, applying an out of plane displacement field. Uh, if we do that, remember that uh, the, the topography has the, the same functional form of uh, the, the pseudo magnetic field. So if we apply an out of plane displacement field, this, uh, this, uh, the on site energies will be modulated in the same way. Uh, uh, with the same functional form of the magnetic field. And uh, if we now look at our effective honeycomb uh, theory, we would find out that there is a sublattice imbalance uh, which is proportional to this mu zero here. So uh, in the A sublattice will be pushed up uh, by three times this quantity, uh, well, something of this order, uh, and the other one will be uh, will have a minus 1.5 this energy. Uh, we can see that as we compute the electronic structure and then you actually see this gap and you see that there is a electron holding balance here, um, the electron hole symmetry is broken because of those uh, two, uh, this imbalance here. So we have three here, minus 1.5 here. You can actually see that these, uh, these blue bands are uh, have nearly half the distance from the Fermi energy compared to the red ones. Right, so by, by tuning this displacement field, we could actually have a topological phase transition, but that's not the point I'll, I'll be talking about. Uh, I'll, I'll actually uh, go a bit further and, and continue uh, a discussion about the, um, about the, the, the experimental side. Um, it was also found out that uh, as you tune the gate voltage, uh, the, the, yeah, 
if you if you tune the gate, so you have the Fermi energy right uh, at the, at the right at this lambda level peak, you actually see that this peak is split into two, which uh, is uh, an indication of correlated states uh, in this buffered superlattice. And if we do uh, Hilbert calculations, uh, we actually reproduce this. Uh, I, I talked about uh, uh, those results in more detail in the previous speaker's corner. Uh, so you can look at, I think, was the first one uh, in the list. And we see that uh, if we set the filling factor to, to be a half filling, uh, there is a gap. And as we, uh, as we populate, uh, or, or if, if we add more holes, for example, in the system, the, the, the gap between those two blue bands is closed. So we see pretty much the same phenomenon. Um, and this is because of a uh, Fury magnetic super lattice that is permanent. Uh, again, I won't enter in much detail on that because I already gave a talk on this very same subject here. Um, but so those are the results with uh, Hubert interactions. We can now that we have a, an effective model of this uh, for this super lattice, we can go a bit further and investigate the the, the consequence of having uh, long range interactions. Uh, by the way, if if you want to make questions anytime, please just unmute yourself. And, uh, I'll say it. Um, yeah, but. If we consider long range interactions, then uh, we found out that we had two competing phases uh, for anti fermagnetism magnetism um, and charge dense to weight. So, so uh, they're sketched right here. In, for one of them, you have, uh, for each sub less, you have uh, a different speed polarization. And in charge dense to weight, you pretty much have a sub lattice imbalance and you just populate one of the sub lattices. Um, so this is the phase diagram, but if we look at the uh, at, at how the gap evolves as we change these Hubbard and, and these long range interactions, we actually see that there's a gap closing in, in other regions that are not really compatible with this uh, phase transition. So uh, we, we're wondering why is that, but uh, and you probably can guess uh, by the title of my presentation that those are indications of topological phase transitions. So uh, let me let me try to give you an idea of what's going on. So uh, if we have charges, we, we pretty much have a sublattice, in, uh, a change in the sublattice imbalance. So this uh, sublattice imbalance mass will change. And if it's larger than zero, then that ratio between uh, lowercase m and capital M is larger than zero. Um, so we have a trigger insulator, and if it's uh, smaller than zero, then we have a quantum valley hall insulator. Uh, because remember now that we, we were mapping the, the valley uh, 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 isospin in our model to the spin, uh, to the actual spin the chain in the model. So we pretty much have a quantum valley hall insulator. And on the other hand, if we have anti uh, magnetism, uh, we have uh, the, the physics is quite similar, actually. We have uh, uh, still a sublattice imbalance, but uh, it changes in sign for different spin channels. So uh, if this is smaller than zero, and then we have a spin up valley hall insulator. And if it's larger than zero, we have a spin down valley hall insulator. We have this spin polarized valley hall uh, phase. Uh, and we can actually compute the, the, the chair number here. So um, looking uh, at, at this uh, last one first, these are the, the mean field uh, uh, approximation for the Hamiltonian. And, and we see that, uh, well, our system is right at this point here where m equals 1. So we set to be the same as the Hopkins constant. That we, and then we're right at the boundary of the topological phase transition, as I said. you. If we increase them a little bit, we, we, we get a uh, trivial insulator, it's the red one here. Um, if we decrease this value of M, we have a, a quantum valley Hall insulator. But uh, as we increase the, the, 
anti-ferromagnetic mass. Uh, we actually have a, an intermediate region here, which is a spin polarized metallic oscillator. So that's why the churn number is just a half of it. Half of the bands are topological and the other half are not. Uh, we can actually now look again at the, the, the phase diagram. So now we're looking at the, the chair number uh, and we can now distinguish the various phases that appear in the system. So we have still the trivial antiferromagnet, the trivial charge density wave, but we also have this region here, which is the quantum valley Hall insulator, which is just a, a, also a charge density wave, but with the opposite uh, sublattice imbalance. And we have this spin polarized quantum valley Hall insulator right here. Um, we can all, uh, you might be asking yourself why those, those uh, changes in the churn number are that smooth, but that's just because of how we discretize the, the, the K, the K point, uh, yeah, how we discretize the Brillouin zone. If we uh, improve the, 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 this discretization, we get actually sharp transitions. And we can also take a look at the bands and, and here uh, I plot the, the projected, uh, the bands projected on sublattice. So you see that for, for, for trivial uh, charge dense waves, this uh, A plot here, uh, there, uh, you basically see the same uh, sublattice character, for the same, uh, the same happens as we look at the trivial antiferromagnet. But for the other ones, we see that there is actually this uh, Bending version that we can see here, and, and also in half of the bands here. So uh, yeah, the, that's pretty much the, the results. But then you might be asking, okay, that you have a, a really good model that works for this effective model. How uh, does it still work uh, when you go to the the full lattice calculations? So uh, in order to answer that question, we we took a look at the situations when we have no Long range interaction. So we basically said that to zero and, and uh, try to run Hubbard calculations um, for this very same system. So we, we got the phase where it's an anti ferromagnet. So this is, uh, of course, the, the, the super lattice, uh, at the super lattice level, it's an anti ferromagnet. But as you look closer to it, uh, it's actually a ferrimagnetic uh, part of parameter that's modulated as, as you go uh, over the structure. So um, in this situation, if we are in the topological phase transition, it has to tune a bit different to, to have just the right value of Hubbard uh, constant here. So you see that if we have no long range interactions, we, we and, and an antiferromagnet, we, we need to set uh, right at this region here. And when we do that, uh, what we actually get uh, are those sort of helical edge, edge states. They're not exactly helical because again, this is not spin, this is the valley number. But uh, if, you, if you take a look, those are indeed edge states. So this is, the, the, this is for a nano ribbon, uh, which is finite along the y direction. And you see that there are, uh, Valley a counter propagate uh, states with opposite valley uh, number uh, at each edge of the system. Um, so yeah, uh, that's pretty much what I uh, had to tell you today. So uh, to summarize, we have a low energy uh, the low energy theory for the system is captured by this Kamey light Hamiltonian. Um, we could uh, control the sublattice imbalance uh, and, and promote topological phase transitions as we change these external uh, by, by applying a perpendicular uh, an out of plane displacement field. But also, the, the competing interferomagnet uh, and charge density wave phases uh, lead to, uh, uh, to this uh, different topological phase. So, uh, that's something uh, that, that I want to highlight in this last uh, last slide, which is uh, although we have those different topological phase here, we could also uh, electrically control them with this out of plane uh, displacement field. So we actually end up with the uh, electric controllable uh, valley topology uh, driven by correlations. 
and yeah, of course we get them a different quantum hull, quantum valley hull insulator base. So that's all. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions left in the chat. Um, thanks, Antonio. So I have a quick question. So first of all, uh, now I understand that uh, here, since you have not really a uh, a spin hole effect, you the the topologic or the the valley hole phase is not so the or the edge dispersion of the valley hole phase is not protected by any kind of uh, symmetry. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, do you know do you know what happens at the edges what kind of dispersion relations arise etc yeah so uh, i mean you mean that uh, those are ah, right yes yeah. so so yeah right so here is here i find some something peculiar right because here the gaps are not there there's no gap neither but so it seems that this boundary condition doesn't isn't isn't uh, good enough to gap the edge states even though they could be gapped yeah, sure. Well, uh, I understand that to get those edge states, you need to break the valley conservation. Uh, so right now we, we have no term that breaks valley conservation. Uh, it, of course, uh, that might be a, a fragile to disorder. So uh, if you have edges that are highly disordered, well, I, I'm not really sure about that. that that's actually a, 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 an interesting question because uh, those edge states are extended to to the super lattice level, so you can imagine the wave functions are quite spread. Out. So I'm not really sure if the wedge disorder just a small a, a tiny region near the edges you actually uh, uh, open a gap in the system because uh, maybe the wave functions are so large that the, having a, a small uh, yeah having small disorder near the edge doesn't have a significant effect, but. Uh, I don't, I don't have a, a con concrete answer for you in that regard. But of course, they will be uh, sensitive to, to this order. Mm -hmm. um, which actually brings me to my second question. Uh, so if I understand correctly, um, all those buckled structures have, uh, have a macroscopic disorder that comes from like slight misalignments, right? Uh, like over here, there's, there's one region that it's buckled one way, over here, the other way. Uh, do you know if there's if this gives rise to any kind of uh, interesting uh, long range inhomogeneity, like on the scale longer on the scale of the of of the super lattice changes, or did you did you consider basically displaced super lattices or stuff like that? Uh, we have not considered, but uh, you can actually see that in the experiment. So one thing you can clearly see, uh, I, I don't know uh, about other. Uh, Things that might happen in the super lattice scale, but uh, a very thing. Well, here is not really easy to see, but if you look at the paper, they have uh, better plots uh, about that. So uh, I don't know if you can see that, but right here, the the, the super lattice scale is quite small. So uh, there are those tiny dots right here, um, and the distance between them actually is larger when you look at this region here. So it, of uh, for sure, you have some sort of strain in the super lattice scale. So uh, the 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 the, uh, the effective lepton linear distances are changing, uh, but uh, we haven't considered any of those effects or not even disorder or anything like that. All right, thanks. <laughs>